continuing our Sunday morning at the Church of Foundation, we have uh, Lucien who is reformulating quantum theory. So I wanted to give a, a title that was conveyed somehow the, the emotions behind this uh, work. You know, people usually give technical titles. I wanted to give a title that conveyed just how emotional this whole thing has been. So here it is. This is the, uh, the title. Yeah, I think you'll agree. This is clearly very uh, emotional. Um, so the question I want to ask is why? Why not? We're going to be here a while. Okay. <laughs> so in particular, why quantum theory? Why not quantum theory? <laughs> Good question. Um, so, um, ten years ago, I posted a paper on the um, archive. Um, Quantum. Are you saying this paper you posted 169 years ago? No, no, ten, no, no. no ten. <laughs> this is just ten years ago. Um, and, and this paper was in this paper I, I derived the title of the paper was quantum theory from reasonable from five reasonable axioms, and the idea was to try and give a set of somehow reasonable axioms from which you could derive uh, quantum theory. Uh, and for the most part, I was happy with that paper, but there was one axiom I really didn't like. It was a kind of simplicity axiom. It forced you to take the simplest case that was compatible with the other uh, axioms. And for me, that, that wasn't really very um, satisfactory. Uh, so for 10 years, I've struggled with this. 10 years of um, near madness and crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Incredibly difficult ten years. A lot has happened in ten years. I got married, had a kid, but all the time I've been working on this um, problem. Um, and then, 13, uh, 13 months ago, uh, I was here in Belez, and um, at the end of my talk, um, someone, and I'm pretty sure it was Bill Edwards, but it might have been Ross, 9th uh, century is Bill, asked a quite one of those annoying questions. Um, I wrote down an equation. He said, why is that equation so complicated? Uh, he kind of got me thinking. And out of that came the Duo Tensor Framework. And once I got the Duo Tensor Framework in place, it was possible to, um, to move on to um, readdressing this question that had been bothering me for, for, for 10 years. Um, so finally, uh, this week, as I was flying on the plane to uh, Barbados, I, I finished writing um, the paper. This is a, an earlier draft. Um, uh, I haven't printed it out yet. And the paper is, well, guess how many pages long? It's not, it's not a short paper. <laughs> um, okay. So I think you'll agree this conveys very accurately the emotional content of this. So this, um, this is based on um, the, the, something I call the circuit framework. The circuit framework is kind of what you think it is. It's just. Um, allowing yourself to draw circuits, represent experiments by circuits where you have boxes and, um, and wires connecting them. Uh, and I won't go into any detail about that because I don't think I'll have time. Um, um, and I'm going to give some operational frameworks, sorry, some operational postulates for, for, from which you can reconstruct quantum theory uh, within this circuit framework. Uh, so incidentally, I'm very happy to take uh, questions, of course. Um, so, um, so, I need, so before I can give you the postulates, uh, I need to give you a bunch of um, basic um, uh, ideas, most of which I imagine are pretty familiar, but uh, still, let, let's go through this. So, first idea is the idea of a maximal set of distinguishable states. Imagine we have um, preparations, so I have time going on. We have various different preparations, uh, and from all the different sorts of preparations that we have for a system of a certain type, this is the type. So this could be um, for a spin half particle, for example, or something else. Of course, we're being more general, we're not talking about quantum theory in particular, just general 
physical theories, we have preparations. Um, it may be that you can find subsets of preparations which can be distinguished by some measures. So here's um, a subset of preparations as a label n. So we have n equals 1. big N. This is for the particular type of system. Um, uh, and um, in order for this set to be distinguishable, I want it to exist some measurement which has outcomes uh, labeled by M. Uh, and it has to be such that uh, we get um, that the probability if I send in a preparation uh, uh, by n, then I, think, then I certainly get the corresponding uh, outcome up here, uh, and I get zero probability the other way. Okay. So if that is true, then there exists a measurement up here which distinguishes <coughs> this um, set of things. And I want this to be a maximal set, so I want this to have the maximum number of elements. So there shouldn't exist any set of distinguishable states that has more elements than this. Of course, it may not be unique. There may exist many sets for a given type of system. Uh, there may exist many sets of distinguishable states uh, with this number. Is that, is that clear? Um, so here, Na is an important property. This is one of the um, things that characterizes your system type. And so obviously, if you have, say, uh, a spin half particle, then Na is equal to 2. It's just the, in the case of quantum theory, this is just the dimension of, of the Hilbert space. Um, okay. Um, so the next uh, notion I want to um, talk about is the idea of states. So states are associated with um, preparations. So uh, here's a preparation for a system of some type. And of course, uh, I can put many different, um, many different, uh, I can close this into a circuit in many different ways. Single out. Okay. Uh, and I call that a result. So this this thing is um, this thing is a preparation. This thing is a result. Um, and so I can have many, many such things in principle. There are many things like many um, many um, outcomes of many measurements I could put on top of my preparation. Um, and um, we can think about the probability. Of seeing um, of seeing this particular thing happen, so the probability that this preparation is successful and that we see this particular the outcome associated with this result. Um, this is a this is a very long list of probabilities that we can imagine. Um, now, generally in physical theories, th these different quantities are. Um, uh, related to each other. So, for example, in the case of quantum theory, um, the probabilities for for seeing uh, when you have a given preparation, and then you look at the probabilities associated with different um, outcomes of, of different measurements, then um, those probabilities are related to each other um, um, in in some linear way. Uh, and so, um, and indeed, we we can just um, ask in general. Rather than taking this full set of all probabilities of all conceivable um, results, we can compress ourselves down to a short, a smaller set.
problem in giving this talk on a blackboard because I use two different fonts in the paper. Um, so um, for the types representing the systems, I use sans serif font. Whereas for this, which is just an, a, a label, an integer label, which runs from one up to some um, k sub a, I use um, just ordinary mass font. So I'm going to put an orange soap around this one. Just to indicate that's a different font. Um, so the idea is that I should be able to compress down to a shorter list of probabilities. And from this shorter list of probabilities, I can calculate any of the probabilities in this longer list by a linear equation. Okay. So I can always demand, I can always try and do that. It may be that I don't succeed in compressing at all, in which case I just have a list which is as long as the one I started with. But in general, you can expect that you will be able to compress. Um, and I'm going to call this thing, I'm going to represent it by um, just this. Okay. So this list of probabilities is just going to represent it by this um, this. Um, so the compressed list doesn't have a distribution, No. In, in quantum theory, it will, not, it will generally it will not be a distribution, although you can make it a distribution. Okay. Lucy, can I, can I, just, I, want, I want to ask before you get to the end of the talk, that I'm probably going to forget. But you said you had these five postulates, yeah. right? And, and you said the one that you were uncomfortable with was the simplicity, right? right? Yeah. I don't remember what that one is, but I remember there's this other one that says there's a continuous reversible yeah, yeah. transformation. Are you, I mean, are you okay with that he, one? He didn't like that. No, 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 I, I thought it was... Yeah, I mean, that one's gone as well, actually. Oh, is it the new, new Yeah, so the new set of axioms are better than the previous set in, in many respects. So now you can derive um, the kind of transitivity property, at least, in, 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 in the before, and you get you get the continuity property in the end. Yeah, so that, that's also done. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> okay. um, sorry, my, my notation is a bit badly. What, what I really mean is that um, is that is that a is just equal to the probability of, um, associated with some particular um, result, uh, and then I have the list of these probabilities going from one from one to k sub a, and that list of probabilities is sufficient to specify the state. So what that means is that if I have something like the probability of a b. That should just be given by a linear expression. Like so. Um, incidentally, in the paper, I also use sensory font for that. It's going to get complicated if I draw a lot of orange circles. So I also use sensory font for this, and I use normal mass font for this. Um, but this is more important. The, uh, this A is a, is a label going from one to this. So there's some sub summation here? Yes, so summation is in. There's really a disconnect between this being an A and this being an A. But where are we storing these coefficients? I mean, isn't this extra. We, we perform this compression, but yeah. we still have to retain that we all these coefficients so that we can recover our long list of coefficients. So what it is is, so associated with any preparation, you have a state. So this is, this is what I was trying to find a state. So this object. Um, is, is a state here. Um, and then um, associated with any result, the thing up at the top is, is, a, is an effect. Okay. And so the place that um, the information is being stored to decompress this is, is in the specification of the effects. Any more? I mean, this, this is fairly standard stuff in lots of different um, operational approaches to quantum theory, so complex properties framework you'll see. Maybe not this notation, but this, this basic uh, structure. Okay. Yeah, so actually, incidentally, we've introduced a second important number here, which is case of A. A here is the type. So now, um, once we define what we mean by states, there's a few uh, important concepts um, we can uh, talk about. So pure states. states which can't be written as uh, convex um, sums. So, mixed
mixed states are states which can be written as convex sums. So a state is mixed if we can write lambda a prime plus um, 1 minus lambda a dolman, where lambda is greater than 0 less than 1, uh, and a prime and a double prime are distinct states. So that would be a mixed state. If the state is not mixed, uh, then it's a pure state. like this maximal measurements. But each outcome of a maximal measurement, in other words, each particular value of m is a maximal result. Uh, and then associated with a maximal result is a maximal effect. So in a sense, uh, preparations are uh, preparations are to states as results are to effects, um, and uh, we have all these different concepts we can uh, we can talk about here. So the next thing I want to do is is talk about a filter. subset of the outcomes of that maximal measurement. So for example, OF might be equal to 1, 3, 7. Yeah, some subset of the possible outcomes of the, um, of the maximal measurement. And the fil a filter has to have um, two properties. Preparations which only give rise to non-zero probabilities uh, when the um, when there is when the outcome M belongs to this set, um, then um, if you send this preparation onto the filter, the state passes straight through unchanged. In other words, it means that this is equivalent to it. Okay, that's a fairly standard. Okay. So if the state has support uh, in this, in the outcomes associated with this set, uh, given by this set, then the filter doesn't affect the state. The preparation is the same thing. Um, Which only has support in the in the um, in the um, 
um, complement set, um, uh, then the filter blocks the um, state. state followed by the filter, that's just equivalent to having the null state, the state which doesn't give, which gives zero probability for every um, result. Um, yeah, so in, in, in when, I, when I define the circuit framework, uh, um, um, so a circuit is generally given by And I, I've suppressed um, the um, I've suppressed the drawing the, the um, structure associated with outcomes. You can draw it like this. For some outcomes on this device, okay, that's really encoded in the notation A, and likewise here. And then the probability for this circuit is just the probability that I see this outcome and this outcome. Okay. So it's, a joint, it's, a joint, it's a joint probability. Okay, and, and you're asking what is the interpretation of probabilities. Yeah, so I tried to sidestep that question. I mean, you can interpret probabilities in lots of different ways, as um, Bayesian probabilities, as, as propensities, as frequencies. Um, as long as this probability is satisfied, the usual sorts of postulates that they add to one, and, and you know, they then they're okay. Um, um, yeah, and, and the one thing I do assume in the circuit framework is that you can give a probability uh, for a circuit uh, and that probability is independent of any other circuit you may have around that are disconnected from this one. Could they be valued in some abstract state rather than zero one? Uh, I, 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 I don't go there, but maybe one could go there. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I assume I assume my probabilities are between zero and one. And I think that's essential for the reconstruction. Um, but maybe if you drop that, you would get some more general class of these. This null set that gives zero probability for everything. Yeah. Is that like the zero vector? Yeah, so if it was written as um, one of these vectors A, then all the components are equal to zero. Right. Yeah, and so that means that when you take... Um, yes, so when you take... Um, subspace with respect to given uh, for a given other space and, and um, they block stuff in the in the um, complement of other space. But it's a more general operational definition that we give. Lucian, what, what are the, the states here? Are you just assuming it's some set of things that are called states and they no. would give rise to these probabilities? So so um, the states so I went for that construction where I talked about all the different uh, we could close the yeah. certain different things and have this long list of possible probabilities. Right. Then I said, well, you generally you can compress that down to a smaller list. And if you compress it down optimally, so you can still reconstruct the bigger list by a linear expression, like I gave. But then that compressed thing is my, my state. So now those things, you would want them to belong to some set of possible states. Um, and part of the problem of reconstruction is to, is to show you know, what, what's the characteristics of that bigger set of, of states. Um, that they belong to. Also, when you reconstruct, you have to characterize what's what's the um, what's the nature of the set of um, results. The results, sorry, the, re the results are, are um, associated with effects, and the effects are really just the coefficients in the expansion. Um, so yeah. So, the, so, this, so then, what a state is? Is it sort of <coughs> it's this compressed list of probabilities that yeah. you can use to reconstruct? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so you're, you're choosing a particular. Fiducial set of uh, results. So basically, a fiducial set of outcomes associated with uh, measurements. So just a special set that you choose for that purpose. But given that special set, you can reconstruct the um, uh, probability for any, any uh, results. Okay. So should there be an unique probability? No, there's, generally there's not unique probability. Yeah, then there's no reason for this to be. So basically, you're kind of choosing a basis. 
So then when you, when you, um, when you compose things, like, you know, this is up and down. Yeah. You know, so it means you have to make sure that you get the, these notch shots. That's what? Uh, it's just the same, with respect to the same basis. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, um, it, it, these objects kind of transform. So if you change your basis, then, then you, they, they transform like tenses. Um, there's, there's more general class of objects like this that transform as well. I, I call the tenses. They're more richer class of things. But for the moment, just, these things are just like tenses. They transform them in a sort of, as, in a way you'd expect. If you change your producial set of um, the results, then you affect a transformation. Do you think of these states as states of something? Is there um, so, a um, so I, I try to be as operational as possible. So I, I told you how to construct these states. Uh, now you're asking me a philosophical question. Yes. Um, right. I, I, um, so, so whatever my answer would be to that, it wouldn't affect how the reconstruction works. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't know. I don't know how I think of it. It really depends what you think of as probabilities. Yeah. You know, so if you take the, the sort of Hootsian approach, you believe probably these are, are, are states of belief, but then they wouldn't be states of your underlying system because they're states inside your, your, your brain. It's a, it's a, it's a big debate. <laughs> yeah, it's a big yeah. kind of lump. Yeah. So. Okay. Move on to... Um, right. The next concept. Um, Actually, one thing I meant to talk about here was um, so we have we have pure states and mixed states, and you can imagine um, some transformation. Um, so I call the transformation non-mixing if whenever you send a pure state in, um, you get a pure state out. Okay. Actually, I, um, so there's, there's a slight subtlety. I don't mind if this pure state is only pure up to normalization. So it could be proportional to a pure state. It could be a mixture of a pure state and a null state. Um, so a, a non-mixing transformation is one which, when I send a pure state in, I get a pure state out up to normalization. Right. Um. So I want to give this def definition, this idea of a non-flat set of states. I'll just write down the definition. So a set of states is said to be non-flat if it is a spanning subset of the full set of states that are passed unchanged by some filter. So imagine you have a set of states and you want to know if they're flat or not, according to this definition. Well, you look around, if you can find a filter which is such that this set of states in your candidate set spans the full set of states that are passed unchanged by this filter, um, then you have um, a non-flat set of states. So in the case of quantum theory, um, a set of states will be non-flat if 
they all have support on some given subspace of your hub space for the system, and um, they spanned that hub space. Um, I'm talking here about projectors, about density matrices. So they're, 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 uh, they're, 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 they'd have to span this, the space of the um, of the emission operators uh, the, to act on that given uh, subspace. But this is a more general operational definition. So in general, we mean spanning in the sense of you can reconstruct the big list of probabilities by this linear equation that you have before. What I mean is, um, I have uh, so I have some some filter. Here, here's the set of all um, here's the set of all, all states, things like this. Which are, uh, which are un which pass through the filter unchanged. Uh, and now, I, now I have a subset of states which are in my candidate set. Um, it's called B. Some index. I've, I've so got I then got my my subset. Uh, I should be able to write any state in this in this in this full set of states as a linear combination of the states in this set of states. Um, yeah. So they just they, this this state span. This um, subspace. Is that, is that clear? Um, so what would make the set? Yeah. Maybe we're not non yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I just thought it came up with. I mean it seems um it seems um um, um if the set is flat, then it's got fewer it's got fewer dimensions, it doesn't doesn't sort of live in the full. Space associated with this uh, with this um, filter. You know, it's not sort of fully. It's not fully popping. You know, it's not fully spanning this like space. Play, uh, yeah, it's like a sub, like a lot of plane. Yeah. Can so you call it full? Is that a space full? Uh, I could have done. Yeah. 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 I, I um. My, my wife bought me for Christmas this toy, which is a sort of um. I guess a star that expands out, but then you can squash it flat into a low. You know, it's actually. Three-dimensional force people squashing into one dimensions, and it just seemed that squashing it flat was the, uh, the way to think about squashing it down. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you, can you explain what you were why it's not always possible for any sort of state to find some filter? Only passes. So, so let's give um, a case of quantum theory. Um, so taking quantum theory, if I have a filter, so I imagine I have a set of two sticks. Okay, they can just be I've got a bigger double space, say a five-dimensional double space. My set states just consists of the zero, so the one state and the two state. It's a complete orthonormal set. Okay, so that's a set of states I can test. Now that set of states will span, will pass through the filter that projects onto the one, two subspace. Um, and uh, you're not going to find a smaller, you're not going to find any smaller subspace that will pass through. Um, and clearly that, those two states do not span the space of emission operators. Associated with that, because that space is 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 not is um. Do span the full space which is passed by that? No, 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 no. They pass they span the, the, on the Hilbert space, but not on the, not of the projection operators that um not not of the um space of the vision operators. Because states states in quantum theory are given by density matrices. So density matrices live on in the space of um operators that act on. Is that, is that clear? Okay. Um, so, so you can prove actually that uh, in quantum theory, any non-mixing transformation is also a non-flattening transformation. I should define what I mean by non-flattening transformation. So a transformation is non-flattening if, whenever you send a set of states in that's non-flat, the set of states that come out is also non-flat. That's not a trivial statement because it could be that the set of states that go in are actually, you know, for example, in quantum theory, they could correspond to a five-dimensional Hubble space. But the set of states that come out that correspond just to a two-dimensional Hubble space. Um, but, um, but nevertheless, if, if the original set of states are non-flat, and, and, and then the final set of states are non-flat, and that's true for any input non-flat set of states, um, then I'd say that the transformation is non-flattening. And so it turns out in quantum theory that uh, non-mixing transformations are also non-flattening transformations. Um, it's not completely trivial to prove that, but not too difficult. 
these transformations in the case of quantum theory, are they, are they just unitaries? No, the more general class of CP maps. So is, 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 that what it, is that exactly what it works out to be? Um, class of CP maps? Yeah, it works out to be the, set, the class of completely positive non, tra trace non increasing maps. Okay. They can decrease the trace. In fact, filters decrease the trace, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, of course, I'm trying to give general operational definitions because I don't want to assume right. quantum theory. Um, Okay. Right. Um, so I think now I have in place all the um, concepts that are necessary to give you the postulates. Um, Filters are, are non flattening. Um, and that's one of the postulates. Um, filters are both non mixing and non flattening. In fact, you can see the filters are non mixing because if you send the pure state in, in quantum theory, you just cut off the state. So I thought they were flattening. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that, that's uh, yeah. So filters, so one of the postulates, the last one is going to be the filters are non mixing and non flattening. Um, and um, actually, generally, I haven't quite been able to. This, there's a conjecture in the paper. I haven't been able to prove that in this general operational framework that um, in the field of postulates that any non-mixing transformation is non-flattening. But generally, it, generally it's difficult to imagine how, mi how non-mixing transformations could be flattening um, because they've got to preserve, they've got to make sure that the states are, are still proportional to pure states afterwards and the pure states are extremal. Yes. If you squash okay. yourself flat, they end up in the interior. Yes. And so there's a, there's a relationship between those concepts which I haven't been able to prove by I, I, I decided to. I mean, I, I use the whole to bring that. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, so the postulates. I'm not entirely happy with the names I give for all the postulates, but uh, I think of better names. Um, so the first one is uh, definiteness. So here's the idea. Um, seems like the gods are not too happy with this. Um, um, I'll read it out first, then I'll write it down in the previous form. So definiteness. So the idea here is that associated with any given pure state is a unique maximal effect, given probability equal to one. And also, that this maximal effect doesn't give probability 1 for any other pure state. So I'll write that down. Basically, this is saying that the sort of one-to-one -one map between maximal effects and um, so between pure states and maximal effects, which is kind of what you'd expect. I mean, maximal effects are somehow the most um, the, the, the sort of most fine-grained measurement you can make. And pure states are the states which have a sort of maximum knowledge. You can't, you can't have a state which is pure than a pure state. Uh, and so you'd expect that they're associated with maximal effects. And this 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 postulate just makes that association. Uh, uh, 
the operation definition of pure state? Sorry? What's the operation definition of pure uh, so state? I gave, it, I gave it earlier. It's, oh, uh, an operational state is associated with preparation that can't be simulated by a mixture of preparations. Okay. I gave, of course, I gave you the definition that you can't be written as a complex combination. It's, it's okay. Um, okay. Is uh, information uh, locality. So, incidentally, this did exist in my original um, paper from 10 years ago. Um, and I'll read it out. Uh, so, this says that a maximal measurement on a composite system is affected if we perform maximal measurements on each of the components. So, imagine you have some composite system um, having many components, uh, and then you perform maximal measurements on each of those components. Um, and then you look at what kind of measurement you've affected in total. But that should also be a maximal measurement, um, according to this. system of type AB, um, then the um, number of, um, of states in a maximal set of distinguishable states should just be given by the product of the number in each of the two subsets. That's equivalent. It's equivalent to my um, this is this So this goes both ways. You've got a max maximal measurement on the composite. Yeah. There are maximal measurements you can find on the components. Um, no, it doesn't go that way. It doesn't. That, that's not true. And that's not true in quantum theory. Either. This just says if you make maximal measurements on the components, then you affect maximal measurements okay. on the composite. Yeah. Yeah. But in quantum theory, that wouldn't be true because you can perform measurements in uh, yeah. an entangled basis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Should those A's and B's have circles around? No, because the, the ones with circles are just labels, integers, whereas these are type. Uh, okay. Postulate P3. Um, uh, locality. Just check. Okay. It means I don't have to tell you how I actually get the quantum theory from this question. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> all the time to go through that part of the thing. Um, um, postulate three, uh, tomographic locality. So this says that the state of a composite system can be determined from the statistics collected by making measurements on the components. I'll, I'll write this down. system, um, um, you know, A and B, and I'm trying to determine, and I've got some states for that, so I've got some preparation, it prepares a state, and I'm going to make measurements uh, on, on many instances of that preparation, and I want to determine what the state is um, of, of, that, of that composite system. Well, it, uh, it, the, the posture that says that it's possible to do that by making just measurements on the components and looking at the joint properties that you get. Okay. Uh, and this is true in quantum theory. It's, um, it's, th this postulate um, um, is, is very natural, and it's, um, you'll find it in many um, in ma many of the, the reconstruction attempts have, uh, in recent years, have this postulate as, as a basic one. It, sort of, it explains why you have complex numbers rather than real numbers, for example, in quantum theory. Uh, and it's equivalent 
for this. Remember, k was the number of probabilities in your vector representing the state. Um, so p3 is equivalent to saying that um, this thing factorizes in this way. It's very similar to this. Do you allow for some sort of limiting procedure in p3? I mean, in general, like giving tomography, you need many, many measurements, right? And only in the end, in the limit, you know something about the state. Oh, right, yeah. So, um, um, you mean you have to keep, you have, you have to build up on the statistics. So I'm, I'm just assuming we have, you know, an infinite ensemble, or what, what depends, it depends partly on what our interpretation of probability is, you know, if, if, um, if we have a different interpretation, we, we may have to have a different procedure, but yeah, I'm assuming that we, we can get our probabilities for some way, maybe by measuring. Well, it's not purely philosophical, because this goes directly into sort of operational groups. They're aiming for an operational interpretation. Um, I suppose what I'm saying is I'm helping myself to probabilities for circuits, uh, as a free, without, without discussing how you get those probabilities. So I'm saying that any circuit, this is the kind of circuit we'd be interested in in this case. Okay. So I have some state, some preparation for present state. I'm helping myself to these probabilities. Uh, and then what this what this assumption is saying is that these this, this, this probabilities um, can be used to with, 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 with different, um, you have to use different um, uh, results here. Can be um, can be used to reconstruct the state associated with this preparation. Now, sure, if that wants to do that in the laboratory, then you've got to you've got to you know collect enough statistics for that purpose. Um, I'm, I'm not worrying about that side of things. I mean, it does it does there, there is a whole question that's raised here, which is you know if you were to think more carefully about probability and have a deeper appreciation of it, maybe that would lead to a deeper reconstruction of quantum theory. Um, my attitude is, you know, is that the, the interpretation of problems with probability are already quite difficult. So, so I'm kind of putting those to one side and just taking probabilities as, as given. Okay. P3. P4. I guess I need to... I'm writing down now to give you both classical probability theory and quantum theory, and no other theories are consistent with them. Um, if I want to get quantum theory, I have to modify P4 prime slightly, um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So P4 prime is permutatability. So the idea is, well, I'll read it out is uh, there exists a reversible transformation on any system affecting any given permutation of any given maximal set of distinguishable states for that system. Okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, there exists a reversible transformation on any system affecting any given permutation of any given maximal set of distinguishable states for that system. So imagine I have a, uh, some system has three distinguishable states. You know, so I have some set of three distinguishable states, one, two, and three. I can find a reversible transformation that commutes them, so one can go to three, two can say where it is, and whatever the other. Yeah, commutes them in any way. Yeah. Um, so, so this is a very classical notion that I can, it's just yeah, given some set of distinguishable states, which is kind of classical, it's a classical idea anyway, I can commute them by some transformation in any way I want, in a reversible fashion. Quantum theory is saying something like the unitary, the permutation group acts unitarily on the state state. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's true. Yeah. Um, since I don't want to talk about unitary yeah, no, yeah. um, So these will certainly be unitary transformations. Uh, So, 
much of a peak for prime, there exists a reversible permutation with respect to any maximal set of statistical states. Um, Posh to P5. Uh, so I told you this already. Uh, I call it. So this is the assumption that filters are non-mixing and non-blacking. Sorry, what's that word state before space? This one. Yeah. Distinguish. So, distinguishable, yeah. So, distinguishable, yeah. So there exists a reversible permutation with respect to any maximum set of distinguishable states. So the last one, the last posture of P5, I call it preparability. And this is the um, posture that the filters are non-mixing and non-blacking. is that for finite dimensional uh, quantum theory, sorry, sorry, for the finite, for the finite n case, uh, this set of postulates is consistent with only two theories, which are classical probability theory, which is where you have, um, you know, states of just distributions, can, give, can be given by just distributions and, and um, maps, and stochastic maps and so on. Um, and, uh, and then it's also cons and it's consistent with quantum theory and nothing else. So just those two theories are consistent with this set of um, five postulates. Um, so in particular, um, in the previous paper ten years ago, I had this relationship with k is equal to n to the power r. Uh, this is this really follows um, really from these two assumptions, or well, you can see it from here. If you have these two things plus a few more natural requirements that follow from the postulates as well then you can prove that k is equal to n to the power r. Um, and I show that there's only two values that are consistent with these postulates, the only two values of r that are consistent, which is r equals 1, the classical case, and r equals 2. And then, of course, in addition, you have to get all the structure of quantum theory, uh, the sort of CP maps and, and, and states being represented by density matrices and so on. Get all that from that from these postulates after um, um, If you want to um, get, if you want to get you want to set five uh, postulates that give rise to just quantum theory, so you rule out classical theory, uh, then you have to, then you can add anything, anything you like, which is consistent with quantum theory and yet inconsistent with classical probability theory. Okay, so anything will do, um, which is kind of sad because uh, I started this um, talk with the question why why quantum theory. Well, it's sort of the answer from this kind of point of view is any reason you want, as long as it's inconsistent with classical probability theory and consistent with. Well, that kind of presupposes you know the answer. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, could I ask? I mean, what, what is, I mean, it's probably a, an annoying question, but I mean, what, what is this? How could we think of the status of these postulates? In what sense? So? Well, I mean, why should we? I mean, so we would like to understand why quantum. I mean, I suppose that's yeah. the question: why quantum? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, if we, so these, these, aren't, these don't look like sort of like the laws of thought or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, so, so how, why are they compelling? Right, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I spent some time in the paper talking about why I think each of them is, is compelling. I and mean, some of them I think are more compelling uh, than, than others. The so, uh, tomography locality I think is very compelling when you start to look at those models. If you don't have that, there's a lot of things. Specify some part of the world, and they specify another part of the world, and then the joint specification of those two things is just given by the um, specification of those two things separately, um, and then that works. In this, in this um, so I think each of these is compelling, but, but maybe not as compelling as one wants. I don't think this is um, this is the final. Yeah, and one uses that. And I, I think also this one is pretty compelling as well, the, the, the um, um, information locality. Um, 
I mean, ex even, even this, I think, is pretty compelling that you should be able to, if you've got some set of things that can be distinguished, that you should be able to commute them. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, um, to, to sort of do stuff in the world, you know. Um, I mean, perhaps the reversibility requirement is a bit stronger than the right ones, but commutatability, I think, is a very natural thing to be able to do. Um, um, this, this one, I, I think, well, number five and number one, I think, are the, the less natural uh, postulates. Um, um, and it's interesting that the way the proof works is, is just from depth, just from postures one through four, or one through four prime, you get a lot of structure, um, and you only need you only need this um, posture um, sort of after you've already built a lot of the structure. So you may need to find an alternative for this. So what what does that in particular give you? This is three, um, so there's a there's um, there's a key. There's some key things in the, um, in the group that you have to do. So, so it's very simple to show um, from the well, so you, you can show from the first four that you can get that, that for, for a generalized bit, I call it a G bit. The um, the, um, the set of states have to lie um, on the surface of a hypersphere. Okay, so that's, I mean, you see that result everywhere. Um, but then. Um, but then you want to prove that actually all points on that hypersphere correspond to states. Uh, uh, and so this, um, this non-flattening uh, is, is used to get that. Uh, basically, I keep sending a set of states through a filter, and they, they move closer, uh, through an appropriately chosen filter, and they move closer and closer to one of the, um, one of the, um, the um, poles of this, uh, of this class hypersphere. And so you end up showing that the, the, the whole surface has to be covered in states. And then, sorry. Some kind of continuity? Yeah, so in, in, in the circuit framework, we didn't talk about it. In the circuit framework, I help myself to uh, an appropriate um, um, Which operation is very, very well motivated because there's no way of distinguishing the case where I make the assumption that you're anticipating in the case where I don't. And the sort of global strategy is you sort of you show that the single bit, bit thing has to look like, well, it has to look like, and then you can express compound systems. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the global strategy is first of all you you show that all you have the hypersphere, yeah. um, but that's not the right dimension. You've got to get it down to being a, a two sphere. That's for a quantum bit, for a qubit, it's a two sphere. Uh, so then uh, I use a trick that was um, invented by um, Kirigella, um, um, Dariano, and um, Perinotti. Uh, you know, Mara, probably Julio again. Yeah. Um, and um, and show you show that um, there's a relationship um, uh, between the probability of successfully teleporting a state and the and the size of your space and k. Okay, so basically the um, probability of success for teleportation is the inverse of, of k. So in, in quantum theory, that's true. You know, you know the probability of success, successfully teleporting a state is one quarter. Uh, and one quarter is exactly the inverse of, of k for a qubit. Um, so, so there's a lot of work done there because you have to show from these axioms that you have enough to set up teleportation. So that takes a lot of um, a lot of. Yeah. So teleportation actually plays a yeah plays a key, key role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means that's the uh, uh, well, um, <coughs> Yeah, um, and, and and again the non-flattening um, assumption plays a key role in this, as does the non-mixing. Okay. I mean, maybe I should just mention before I try to finish. The one, the one thing that um, that gives um, the one thing that gives you um, um, quantum theory over classical theory. The one, the one, the assumption. Like the extra thing I thought that would be good to add was this word compound. So um, a, a transformation. So a transformation is compound. If you can build out the two sequential transformations, neither of which is equal to the identity, okay. Uh, and if you add just that, and you consider the um, the generalized bit case, then that forces you to quantum theory. You can't do that for classical quantum theory. So, um, so if I add this word, then I get axiom uh, four. And those four, those five axioms give you um, those five postulates give you give you um, uh, quantum theory. Um, Okay, good. That's the next question. Another question? Another question? Yes. So what would happen uh, uh, to...
some of your axioms if you would see for a theory where R is single. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time trying to prove the existence of these things, uh, and I wasn't able to. Um, um, at least, at least theories that are, you know, remotely interesting. Um, um, but it was also very difficult to prove that they didn't exist. Um, but certainly, um, um, this, this, this posture, as I was just explaining, is the one that gives you uh, a two-sphere rather than a, you know, some higher-dimensional sphere. And the dimension of your sphere is just, um, is just, um, is just two to the r uh, minus two. Okay, so it's two is n for, for the uh, generalized bit. Uh, and then I have to subtract two because I've got one a rule, a rule normalization, and then I've got I want to go to the surface rather than so. So um, if you can show that this number is equal to yeah, so if you can show that so so if this number has to be um, two, then obviously r has to be um, has to be um, a two. Yeah. Um. You mentioned that you spend a lot of time trying to show that you can do teleportation, so that yeah. you can derive a dimension from the probability of getting there. Yeah. Hey, is there any way to just build like you know the completely mixed state, and then and build like you know the completely random channel that takes every state to the identity, right? The yeah. out of the sort of tools I've got here. Yeah, yeah, and, and because then you would get the dimension of the probability as well, right? You would just measure with respect to anything. Yeah, and it, I mean it might be harder to build. It might be easier to build. Um, yeah, but the notion that you've got, um, you might just also talk about is playing a role in getting you this, this, um, result. Um, so whilst it might be drawing quantum theory, is that a lecture? I'm not, I'm not sure if, um, yeah, not sure, I'm not sure you don't have enough information. The point is not, the point is to actually get this, get a particular value for this probability. Um, and then, then you know that that's related to the universal dimension. I'm not sure. Yeah, so I guess I'm not. I don't know that how, how I could build a totally mixed state, and also get a particular value for this for this probability through okay. these axioms. Yeah, that, 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 that. even though of course you're right, it would be, it would be connected. So you can always work something up with some basic plane or diagrammatically. Why do you still formulate things in words? Um, because this operational language, which is formal. Right. Well, I could. Uh, I could probably. I could probably use pictures more. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of takes away like a. Because it's elegant. Like that's the answer. Like the answer. It works. Yeah, it's beautiful when you write postulates down. <laughs> so then there is kind of a vague of translating them to the formal structure. And you can actually for formulate the words as formal structures. Yeah, I mean, the operational language. Maybe, maybe sort of it's an old like school physics thing, right? It's like the laws of motion. You know, you write the first the words and then you give the equation. Yeah. Then you give the equation. Yeah. You so you do yeah. both. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. the point yeah. would be to, to, I can give you a better translation. But I can give you some of these, I can give you an immediate translation uh, into pictures, like the local demography. You know, I think um, the Pavia group do this. They, give, they translate into this kind of yeah. pictures. Some of them might be a bit more difficult, but like the non, this, this posture. I don't know. I don't know how to turn that into a simple picture. Because the picture is like a measure of how operational they are in a certain sense. Um, it's definitely, definitely a sufficient measure. I'm not sure it's necessary. Okay. Thank you. So we'll uh, kick off again at 11.30.